Good morning. My name is John Hauerwas. I serve as the minister here at Skidaway Community Church. On behalf of our congregation, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to worship with us on this Trinity Sunday. Whether you are worshiping with us here in person or online, we are grateful that you are here with us today. Serving as our guest musician today is a longtime SCC member, Jan Curtis. We are so grateful during this time of transition to have her here with us, offering her gifts and her skills, her time and her energy to make our worship service fulfilling and meaningful. So I encourage you, as the Spirit moves you, to extend signs of your appreciation to her this day. Next Sunday, we will be welcoming the return of the Reverend Ed Ayers, who will soon be serving as our transitional music director. He is known to many in this congregation, having served previously as a transitional minister here. I have great and high hopes for what is to come in our congregation, and I eagerly await his arrival. As we gather to worship this day, we seek to encounter the living God. That is what we do in worship. That is our reason for being here this day. And as we gather, I invite you and encourage you to consider these questions in order that we might grow and deepen in faith together. Number one, um, what is wisdom? And why is it important? What is wisdom and why is it important? Number two, how do we cultivate wisdom in our desire to become wiser? How do we cultivate wisdom in our desire to become wiser? And number three, how does wisdom change the way that we view the world and how we choose to interact with others, with one another and with God? How does wisdom change the way that we view the world how we choose to interact with it, with one another, and with God. Friends, let us worship God. Good morning. In the beginning, when God drew a circle on the face of the deep, wisdom was there rejoicing, delighting in the human race. In the beginning was the Word, with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. In every time and place, God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Blessed are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
around to those seated near you or standing near you. Bless them with the peace of Christ. And those at home or streaming the service, please feel free to commune with your neighbors. May God's peace be with each of you this day. And as we think about what our scriptures are invoking us to think about this day, we think especially about wisdom. And I want to speak with you for a moment about wisdom. I made a joke back on Mother's Day about how uh, all of these questions come flying at mom, right? And there might just be one question that comes to dad, and that was, where's mom? And when it comes to wisdom, it seems pretty fitting that the Old Testament personifies wisdom as a woman. Isn't that beautiful and beautifully poetic? we learn that wisdom is said to be a little child there at the beginning of creation, delighting at the feet of God, dancing and playing. And each of us are encouraged to remember how important it is for us to dance and play as well, no matter how young or how old we are. We can forget that sometimes, even in a place as magnificent as this island with everything there is to do and see and enjoy play is a very important part of our journey and it's an important part of what it means to be wise so wisdom as a woman well well she's first this child who's learning and eventually she becomes the teacher and that's the model for us isn't it that we are to grow in wisdom each of the days of our lives until one day we can go and spread that good news about what it means to be wise, to, to know what is right and to do the right thing. And by this, they will know that we are Christians. By this, they will see the love of God flowing from within us. This is our mission and our calling this day to live into the ways of wisdom. Would you please bow your heads and pray with me? O oh God, we honor this day the majesty and the mystery of your name. You are both infinite and intimate, known and unknowable transcendent and transparent. In love, you have made us your own and invite us to join in your divine dance. We will never rest until we rest in you, blessed Trinity, one God forever and ever. Amen. 
together. Now let us offer the prayer that Christ taught us, saying in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Access to the grace of God. Standing in that grace, we now confess our sins before God, seeking forgiveness and peace. Triune God, within our own life, there is in Though we are made in your image, we confess that we distort the triune life. Instead of seeking mutual welfare and common good, we seek our own gain. Instead of quality, justice, and respect, we construct that are unjust. And disrespectful words and actions surface in us. We allow differences to divide us and lead to brokenness. Holy God, forgive us. Restore in us and in our life together the divine image you intend. Make us better, make us generous in equality, make us graceful in diversity, we pray to be one with you and one another through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. To assure you of your pardon, friends, we are still standing in the grace of Christ because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We are set free to love God, neighbor, and to work for the reconciliation of the world. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Out of the abundance of God's own life, we have received the abundance of God's creation, God's word and God's love. Why then should we live as though we are threatened with scarcity? Let us return to God a portion of all that we have been given with joy and with gladness. As you know, there are offering plates at each exit, as well as you may give online. I am aware of two anniversaries within our congregation this week. I know that Tom and Kathy Inglesby are presently away celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary and also Vic and Jean Bell are celebrating 57 years of marriage. Uh, we give thanks for, for each of these couples, for the milestones in their lives. Is there something else to say?
<laughs> Joe gives thanks that Carol has put up with him for 35 years as well. As of Memorial Day, we all give thanks for the special people in our lives, for the ways that they care for us, for the relationships that are abiding and that see us forward. We also give thanks this day for uh, Karen's return. She's been in the hospital following a fall and an infection, and we're so grateful to see her here among the congregation this day. I also wish to inform you that Carolyn Ernest will be undergoing hip surgery on Tuesday, and we keep her in our thoughts and prayers as well. Please bow your heads with me and let us pray. Holy God, you are more than we can know or name. Yet we call on you again and again, for you alone are God. We cannot live apart from you, for you have called us into your triune life. Your steadfast love surrounds us all our days. Wherever we may be, on a high mountain or a path in a shadowed valley, at a crossroads on our journey, outside the gates of welcome, or in some inner circle, you call to us, delighting in the human race. We come before you in thanksgiving for all the gifts you have given us, for the beauty of this season for the lives of those who bless us beyond their knowing, for this community of faith by which we are nurtured and challenged, for opportunities to serve you by serving others, for goals accomplished, for the gift of life granted yet again today. We come before you humbly and hopeful in need for those we know who are suffering today because of illness in mind, body, or spirit, for those trying to make a difficult decision, for those grieving a loss and ending a dream deferred. We pray for healing and strength in every broken place of our lives. We long for the hope that you alone can give. Hope that does not disappoint us, but rolls away stones of death and despair. We pray for those whose livelihood is precarious. For those who live at the edge of poverty's precipice. And for those who live in temporary shelter and tenuous provision. In the public square and in the privacy of our conscience, help us to find the will and the way toward a common good. We come before you earnestly and urgently for this world in turmoil, for the chaos loose in the natural world, drought and floods, earthquakes and tornadoes, heal the earth, we pray. May those who are starving, thirsty, or left in destruction's debris be restored. We pray for the turmoil we cause through war and violence, hatred and prejudice, by our indifference and by our calculation. Bring an end to our warring ways until civilians and soldiers live in safety and peace. Root out of our hearts the sea of bigotry and narrow-mindedness. Stir us from apathy. Increase in us empathy that we may love as you love. Living Word, you still have many things to say to us. Speak and we will try to bear them. By your word, may the Spirit guide us into all truth that our lives may glorify you. Amen. Our first lesson this day comes to us from...
Paul's letter to the Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 5, I invite you now to hear the Word of God. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, we boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Friends, this is the wonderful word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second letter uh, lesson comes from Proverbs 8, the first four and then the last several. Does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice? In the heights beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, At the entrance of the portrait, she cries out, To you, O people, I call. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth when there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, when he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's 
first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep. When he assigned to the sea its limits, so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in the, his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. This is the word of God. As I survey this congregation, as I do on a weekly basis, and of course even more than that, by meeting with you during the week as well, I recognize what an incredible amount of wisdom is represented here in you. I say this not because I have a penchant for pandering, but because it is the truth. You see, in my life, it was the influence of faithful Christians which radically altered my own sense of call, my sense of purpose, ultimately my sense of vocation as well. The church built me up. It shaped and molded me. It imparted wisdom. It reminded me that I am loved. Before I became a teacher, I was a student, a student of Scripture, of Christian practice, of theology. I was attentive to the words and the ways of trusted clergy and professors and lay leaders, and in time I learned that God was in the midst of each of those interactions. This, of course, is how the faith is imparted from one generation to the next. Someone has to tell you, right? Whether the, the one telling you is a voice from long ago found in Scripture or the person sitting on your same pew. This is how the faith is imparted patiently, persistently, and with evident, ever-present integrity. Now, I am not naive. I have been in the church long enough to know how often the church has wounded and disappointed people. This is true not only in times past, but also in the present age. And this is the case, is it not? Because the church is comprised of fallible human creatures. Creatures like you and me, those who are striving to live in the image and the likeness of God, and yet who will never fully succeed, no matter how honorable our intentions, sadly, even our leaders will fail and disappoint us. And yet the church endures from generation to generation through hardship and famine, through grief and loss, through war and rumor of war, through schism and through scandal. Because the church is bigger than the religious institutions that we entrust as the formal caretakers of our faith. And finally, it is this knowledge which keeps us from throwing up our hands and walking away in righteous indignation, for we too have fallen short with lives marred by sin. We know this very well, and it keeps us humble, very, very humble. 
Yes, we are broken. Like the church, like every institution comprised of people like us, people who sooner or later will leave us shaking our heads in disbelief and disappointment. Such is the nature of life in community. And yet so many of us have remained steadfast in our commitment to the body of Christ. Why? Because we imagine ourselves not as some embodiment of timeless wisdom. We know all too well that that is not the case. Instead, we recognize our need to be continually grounded in it, this timeless wisdom, and we find it, well, we find it here. And so time and time again, we return to this place because it is special. Here we feel safe to speak the truth to ourselves about who we are and who we long to be. We recall the waters of our baptism being blessed in them. We are reminded of our birth and even our rebirth. We recall only because we have seen birth in images or perhaps we have been there for one in person and and we know how vulnerable those first moments really are of how we entered the world with so much to learn gasping for our first breath we raised our voices we cried out for assistance soon we would be held and comforted and nurtured this is what it means to be loved and this is the foundation the safe strong secure foundation through which we grow in wisdom our second lesson this morning is filled with beautiful poetry this rendering of wisdom personified as a woman. The text flashes back to her childhood where she is dancing and playing at the feet of God. She is there at the beginning of creation, the first fruits, if you will. The text tells us that before wisdom was a teacher, she was first a student listening intently to the divine voice and seeking like a good disciple to become the embodiment of all that she had seen and heard and learned. I can almost hear the voice of woman wisdom speaking through the biblical witness in our first lesson this morning as the Apostle Paul maintains that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope, well, it does not disappoint us. Wisdom recognizes now and always that the journey is filled with struggle. And yet wisdom always keeps its eyes on the prize. William Brown, one of my doctoral professors, maintains that someone who has character is one who exercises sound judgment, knows what is right, and has the courage to act on it. And now with this definition in our minds that someone who has character is someone who exercises sound judgment, knows what is right, and has the character and the courage to act on it, I encourage you to think about the wisest people that you know the stalwarts of faithfulness who have developed the habit of regularly reevaluating their positions and even adjusting them as needed. For wisdom is always, always rooted in humility. 
I once heard a story about two professional colleagues. It was an older male supervisor and a younger female associate. Each had a deep and abiding respect for the other, for their gifts and skills, for their intellect, for their education. They each thought of the other as wise. The two entered a meeting with conflicting opinions regarding the way forward on an important topic and matter. Each listened to the other intently and considered the careful reasoning behind their colleague's position. And then as their time together drew to a close, they realized that they had each changed their minds and adopted the position of their colleague. Once again, they didn't have the same position because they were so influential to the other that they had changed the course of their thinking. Friends, forming character is a lifelong commitment to growing in wisdom. And it has everything to do with emotional learning with self-awareness, with a willingness to change. And it is this posture of receptivity which provides the requisite space for the Spirit of God to enter in. When I was a student at the University of South Carolina, I appreciated worshiping at a congregation where Matthew Covington served as the pastor. Years later, after he had accepted a new call in Kentucky and moved away to his new home, I was delighted to pick up the journal for preachers and to read in there an article containing his thoughts. Covington writes, in premarital conversations I ask couples Do you expect there to be any change in your level of independence after you marry? Now given that people really love their independence, most newlyweds-to-be tell him no. Yet as Covington observes, while folks don't want to give up their independence, they are more than happy to surrender some of their share of the responsibilities. When they marry, they tell him, it will be nice to have someone to help me with things, with cooking and cleaning and maintaining the car and paying the rent and fixing things and doing the yard work and folding the clothes out of the dryer and answering the RSVPs. People enter into this deep and mutual relationship, a marriage, with these almost incompatible ideas. They think that they can remain independent if they want to. But they also believe that they will be deeply and intimately connected to another person in almost everything that matters. And you see, it turns out that the tension between the independent self and a committed union not only describes the complex, blessed relationship that we call a marriage, but it also describes the Holy Trinity of God. The incomprehensible mystery of the three in one. We are, of course, the body of Christ and Also, individually, we are members of it. Endowed with unique gifts and skills and abilities. Collectively and personally. We are pursuing the divine voice in humility and in trust. Like a child, we present ourselves at the feet of the one who delights in our presence. And we hope beyond hope that the student will one day be the teacher. 
able to convey the mysteries of the faith with timeless wisdom. Friends, may it be so. And all thanks be to God both now and forever. Amen. At this time, I invite you to please stand with me as we affirm our faith using the words that are found on our screen or in your bulletin. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through word and spirit. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, the communion of saints called from the entire human family. We believe Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. Together we celebrate our differences as opportunities for mutual service within the one visible people of God. Together we will love each other. Christian friends, I invite you this day to live in patient endurance, to stand firm in the hope that comes from God, that others may see the glory of God made known in Jesus Christ our Lord. May the grace of Jesus Christ grant you peace. May the Holy Spirit guide you into all truth. May the love of God fill your heart so that you may find hope in every circumstance of this life and give glory to God. Alleluia and Amen.